Every Bibles this morning, we turn to Jeremiah, the Old Testament prophet, Jeremiah chapter 26. We're going to be reading there in just a moment. These next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at Jeremiah and really speaking about the importance of the Word of God in our lives. We need God's Word daily. We need a daily dose. Um, and hopefully in your personal life, you value the Word of God, you read it, you seek to practice it, and so we're going to be looking at the Word of God. You know, one day recently, Karen and I were reading through um, Psalm chapter 19, and Psalm chapter 19 is truly uh, one of the most beautiful and poignant psalms of, of, of all. And, and basically, you can take Psalm chapter 19 and divide it into two parts. In the first seven or so verses, uh, it speaks of God's creation. And then the latter verses of that uh, book that contains 14 verses speaks of God's instruction. And uh, theologians have described God's uh, creation uh, in such a way that it is God's general revelation. In other words, we can know something about God through creation, but his instruction is God's specific or God's special revelation. We can truly know God by studying his word. And, and one way that someone illustrated it, and I hope to illustrate it in a similar way to you to help you and me understand the difference between God's general revelation and God's special revelation would be this. And personally for me, one of my favorite artists is a guy named Michael Longo, not to be mistaken with the jazz musician by the same name. Michael Longo is a native of Colorado and his particular form of art is Impressionism. And uh, I like his works, and Karen has been good enough to allow me to have about five of uh, prints of his work uh, in our home, and I enjoy looking at his artwork. But I've never met Michael Longo, but I know something. Because I have his artwork, there is somebody named Michael Longo. There's somebody that did that work, and I know a little bit about him. He enjoys outdoor scenery. He enjoys Italy and scenes from Italy, and of course, he's an Impressionism artist. So I know those things about him, but I know very little other than that. But imagine for a moment were he to have an art show in Farmville. I would probably be the first one that would be in line to, to be in that place. I would try and hopefully have the opportunity maybe even to sit down with him and begin to talk and find out more about him, who his family is, what his interests other than art are and things like that. And after spending time with him engaged in that way, I can know much more about him. And such is the distinction between general revelation and special revelation. In God's creation, we can learn a lot about God. We know that God himself is created. He's a creative individual. We know that he is powerful and we know that he exists. In fact, Romans chapter one says there's enough evidence in creation to hold every person accountable that God exists because God created this. We look at a watch and we know there's a watchmaker. In this world that is much more vast, we try to rationalize and say, well, it just happened randomly. No, it was an intentional creator, God, who created this. It's his artwork. But I appeal to you today, if we're truly to know God, we know him through his word. I wonder today, do you take time in his word? You have this great treasure in your home, and yet often, that treasure is untapped and hopefully today we'll be encouraged because we can know God, we can know the heart of God, we can know the plans of God through his special revelation, the written word of God. Today we're going to look in Jeremiah chapter 26 and we're going to consider Jeremiah's ministry. It wasn't an easy ministry, nonetheless it was a ministry. And we're going to look at God's special revelation how God had a specific message for the people in Jeremiah's time. 
And, and even as God spoke through the prophets of old, we're going to agree today, hopefully when we finish this study, that God speaks to us through his written word. That God has given us his word to give us direction, to give us warning, to help us understand and, and give us counsel in, in various areas. And so hopefully as we study in these next couple of weeks, we'll gain a greater appreciation for reading the word and, and studying the word and applying it to our lives. Look with me in Jeremiah 26, beginning in verse 1. At the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Stand in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. And speak all the words I have commanded you to speak to all Judah's cities that are coming to worship there. Do not hold back a word. Perhaps they will listen and turn, each from his evil way of life, so that I might relent concerning the disaster I plan to do to them because of their evil deeds. You are to say to them, this is what the Lord says. If you do not listen to me by living according by, to my instruction that I set before you and by listening to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I've been sending to you time and time again, though you did not listen, I will make this temple like Shiloh. I will make this city an example of cursing for all the nations of the earth. The priests, the prophets, and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the temple of the Lord. And when he finished the address the Lord had commanded him to, let, to deliver to all the people. Immediately the priests, the prophets, and all the people took hold of him, yelling, you must surely die. How dare you prophesy in the name of the Lord? This temple will become like Shiloh, and this city will become an uninhabited ruin. Uninhabited ruin. Then all the people crowded around Jeremiah at the Lord's temple. When the officials of Judah heard about these things, they went from the king's palace to the Lord's temple and sat at the entrance of the new gate of the Lord's temple. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and all the people, this man deserves the death sentence because he has prophesied against this city, as you've heard with your own ears. Then Jeremiah said to all the officials and all the people, the Lord sent me to prophesy all the words you've heard against this temple and city. So now correct your ways and deeds and obey the Lord your God so that he might relent concerning the disaster he had pronounced against you. As for me, here I am in your hands. Do to me what you think is good and right, but know for certain that if you put me to death, you will bring innocent blood on yourselves, on this city, and on its residents. For it is certain the Lord has sent me to speak all these things directly to you. Then the officials and all the people told the priests and prophets, this man doesn't deserve the death sentence, for he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord. Some of the elders of the land stood up and said to all the assembled people, Michael, Micah, the Morishite, prophesied in the days of King Hezekiah of Judah and said to all the peoples of Judah, this is what the Lord of armies says, Zion will be plowed like a field, Jerusalem will become ruins, and the temple's mount will be a high thicket. Did Hezekiah of Judah and all the people of Judah put him to death? Did not the king fear the Lord and plead for the Lord's favor? And did not the Lord relent concerning the disaster he had prophesied against them? We're about to bring a terrible disaster on ourselves. Another man was also prophesying in the name of the Lord, Uriah, son of Shemaiah from Kiriath-Jerim. He prophesied against this city and against this land in words like all those of Jeremiah. King Jehoiakim, all his warriors and all the officials heard his words and the king tried to put him to death. When Uriah heard, he fled in fear and went to Egypt. But King Jehoiakim sent men to Egypt, Elnathan, son of Achbor, and certain other men with him went to Egypt. They brought Uriah out of Egypt, took him to King Jehoiakim, who executed him with the sword and threw his corpse into the burial place of the common people. But Iakim son of Shaphan, supported Jeremiah, so he was not handed over to the people to be put to death. Let's pray. Father, as we look at your word today, what a treasure it is. And Lord, what a sad thing it is for so many people to never open it during the day, to never consider your counsel, your encouragement, your direction, your message. And Lord, as we spend these two weeks in, in this part of the Bible, I pray that you would ra raise up within us, Lord, a desire for your word. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Jeremiah was a great prophet of God in the 
Old Testament. We studied Noah today, and, and Bob had shared how Noah did that work for a long, long time, and people wouldn't listen to him, even as he was preaching and the work that he was doing on the ark there, people would mock. And, and so as you think about Jeremiah, Jeremiah really received a similar response. The Bible uh, shows how uh, he was persecuted often, how his message was rejected, how he was mocked. Many people uh, would uh, know Jeremiah as the weeping prophet. He preached for years and years about God's message, and yet he was rejected. He was loved by God. He was supported by God. He was encouraged by God. Uh, but in, the, in that same way and through that same ministry, we see that he was rejected by men and disregarded and even persecuted by men. And so today we see that he brings another message. And we would look at it as we're standing outside of that situation and we would say, what a great message from God. What a great man who's willing to warn the people. Oh, which one of us wouldn't want to be warned if danger lie ahead for us? We would encourage that. Yet we see that these people who were filled with pride had no regard for Jeremiah and his ministry. They considered him cursed of God. And so today I want to look at Jeremiah's perseverance. I want to look at the message that he had, but I'll be honest, while we'll briefly look at his perseverance, and as we'll look at it from Jeremiah's perspective, that he continued to carry the word, what I really want to focus on today are the people who were around Jeremiah. The people who lived during Jeremiah's time, many of which would not receive the message. I want us to ask ourselves today, are we the type of persons who welcome the Word of God in our lives? And so today I want to note four things as we look at our text. And the first thing I want you to note with me is the command that God had for Jeremiah. Now we can specifically know when this particular chapter and the events described here take place because it says at the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was um, ruler in Judah and he ruled from 609 BC until about 598 BC. So at the beginning, we would say it was right around 609 BC that uh, Jeremiah was given this message, not just to Jehoiakim, but to the people. Now Jehoiakim had a godly father his father's name was Josiah, and Josiah was one of the godly kings in the Old Testament. In fact, it was during Jehoiakim's father, Josiah's reign, that the book of the law was found. And when the book of the law was found, Josiah woke up. He said, look at what's going on. I didn't realize this. We're not living up to God's word. And he called the nation to repentance. And as you study the history of Judah, there's almost this thought that this rebellious nation, the southern kingdom, who had followed the path really of the northern kingdom of rejecting God, you thought this one light, Josiah, might be a sign of hope that God would save Judah from the Babylonian captivity. But that was not the case because we see after Josiah came another son that served just a very brief time and then came Jehoiakim, another son. And Jehoiakim was a wicked ruler. He followed the path of Manasseh, who was an earlier king of Judah that led uh, the people of Judah into idolatry and all of those things. We saw how God being a specific God uh, for 490 years, the people had rejected uh, the Sabbath year. And so God decided that for one in seven, those 70 years, they would be in captivity in Babylon. Yet we see it was really not God's desire. And so God commands Jeremiah in what we might call the 11th hour of this imminent judgment. And he's calling him. And we see in verse 2, he says, stand in the courtyard, Jeremiah, of the Lord's temple. Speak all of the words that I've commanded you to speak to all of Judah's cities who have come here. And he adds this, hold back nothing. 
In other words, Jeremiah as a prophet was to bring the word of God to the people. And that word was not to be adulterated. It was to be the complete unadjusted word of God. Now, at this point, we know that the people had the word of the law. How do we know that? Because Jeremiah's father, Josiah, it was during his time that the law was found. And instead of hiding that word, Josiah called a great assembly and said, we must adjust our lives. So they had the word of the law. And now we see that God is sending the word from the prophet. You know, as we think about God's word, God gives us his word for our good. He gives us the Bible. He gives us the written word of God for our good. To give us warning that we might avoid the things that would bring us down. To give us encouragement when, when we are going through difficulty. To show us the way of salvation. To show us the heart of God. And so in verse 3 of our text here, he, he commands Jeremiah to, to give the word and he says, perhaps they will listen and turn each from his evil way of life so that I might relent from sending this disaster. You know, God loves us. In the book of Jonah, we see that God loved a very wicked people, the city of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. And many people, if they were rejected by someone, they would say, just forget that, but not God. God looked at this wicked empire. He looked at this wicked city and he sent a reluctant prophet to Jonah. And he told Jonah to preach that the people would repent. And Jonah didn't want to. We looked at that a few weeks ago. Jonah didn't went, want to do that. But God said, look, I have 120,000 of my people who don't know their right hand from their left. Shouldn't, I, shouldn't it be that I desire that they hear the word of God? God wants us to hear the word. That's why he sent the prophets in the Old Testament. That's why we have the scripture before us today. And so we see today, God is reaching out with his word to a rebellious child, Judah. And he says, if you do not repent, he tells us in our text, you're going to become like Shiloh. Now, Shiloh predated Jerusalem as a center of worship for the people of Judah. During the time of the judges, the ark uh, abided there. But Shiloh had a, a terrible end. We don't know all about it. But we do know what happened in the days of Eli. Remember when there was a great war and the Philistines came. Eli heard news of it. He fell back. He broke his neck and died. He was in Shiloh then. And Shiloh from that point forward was not mentioned. And so as, as Jeremiah is prophesying here, all of the people would know the history of Shiloh and the end that came to it. And he's saying, if you don't listen, Jerusalem will become the same way. So God sent his word to the people of Judah because he loved the people as a word of warning. He said, do this or judgment will come. You know, in the book of Proverbs, it talks about the wise person. The wise person hears the word and the wise person applies the word. Now we can't apply the word until we hear it. So how can we begin to know God if we're not reading his word? How, how can we begin to know God if we're not hearing God's word? But in Proverbs 2, it says, for the Lord gives wisdom. How does he give us wisdom? Through his word. Discretion, it adds later, will watch over you and understanding will guard you, rescuing you from the way of evil. That's what God desired for the people of Judah when he sent Jeremiah. But I, I want you to see a second thing, not only a command that God gave to Jeremiah, but the commotion of the people as a result. You know, a couple of years back, I, I read a book that I just saw in a bookstore by Catherine Smith. I enjoy reading biographies sometime. And, and this book by Catherine uh, Smith was called The Gatekeeper. And it's the story of Missy uh, Lahan who in her day was arguably the most powerful woman in the world. She served as personal secretary uh, for Franklin D. Roosevelt throughout his terms as president. And it was known in that day you could not get access to FDR apart from Missy 
Lahan. She was a very simple woman in appearance. Uh, she was not a flamboyant woman. There was no desire she had to, to she totally had a heart uh, for the country and for the well-being of the president. So as the personal secretary, if you desired to have access to him, you had to go through her. Now, as we look at the priests here, and it mentions the priests and the prophets and leaders, you notice in the list of those that oppose, the priests are always listed first in the list here. They're two or three times. The priests, we might say, were gatekeepers for the people of Judah. They were the ones who were to decide this is information that is acceptable, this is not. When the offerings were given, they would decide what was right and what was wrong. Um, when it came to what God expected of people, the priests were considered that way. The problem is the priests in this day were poor gatekeepers. In fact, verse 8, God was giving the word through Jeremiah, and they wanted to lay hands on Jeremiah. And I'm not talking about ordaining him. I'm not talking about blessing him. They literally wanted to destroy him. In verse 11, they were calling for his death. And here, follow what's happening. The people needed the message. Yet these gatekeepers who were looked up to, they were rejecting the message that was to go to the people. Now today, you and I don't have gatekeepers. We live in a, a free country. We have access to it. We can open it any time. We don't have anyone that can say, well, this word of God can't come. We do it. J just this past week, I, I was in Lynchburg at lunch. I had my Bible open. I was just reading, actually studying this text early in the week. This guy who was a homeless guy came by and gave me the thumbs, thumbs up and said, I love seeing you read the word of God. We can read the word of God and open. But many times, we don't even read the God, Word of God in, in private. We don't have gatekeepers. There's no one saying, uh, working against the Word of God. Well, the devil is. But there's no person in your life that is saying, you can't read this chapter, you can't do this. Yet many times, we neglect the Word of God. There are a few things that keep us from the Word of God. One is busyness, a poor excuse we often use. Pew Research has said six in ten people say they're too busy in their lives really to enjoy their lives. Many Christians claim to be too busy to read the Bible. If you're struggling reading the Bible, one of the things that you can do uh, would be take a diary of your day. And, and, and hour by hour, what you do, you would be surprised at the time that was wasted. And that leads to a second thing that hinders the Word of God, entertainment. December 2020 study said that people spend 3.1 hours a day solely on entertainment. If you sleep eight hours, you work eight hours, you're back and forth to work probably another hour, you're eating, you realize that entertainment can infringe on the important things of life. There are many people, they live their lives for entertainment, which never bring fulfillment, yet they never open the Word of God. They can tell you what's happening on the sitcoms. They can tell you what's happening in the news. They can quote Fox News and they can quote CNN for hours and hours. And when they leave it, they feel just as bad as they ever experienced before, yet they'll never open the Word of God. There's another thing that hinders us from reading the Word of God, just a lack of desire. A lack of desire. And we can have that. You know, we make exceptions for the things we want to do and excuses for the things we don't want to do. That's the truth. If someone says, hey, I want you to do this and you really don't want to do, you can come up with three excuses just like that. But if someone is calling you to do something and you really want to do it, you might have a hundred other things you can do, but you'll make an exception. Too many times we make excuses to not read the Word of God and exceptions for everything else. The point is this. God wants us to have the Word of God. God desires that we have the Word of God. And although we don't have the obstacles, often we don't prioritize it. Well, let's look at a third thing. The commitment 
of Jeremiah. We see that in verses 12 through 14. God had given him the command. He did it. Then we see the commotion of the people. They were against him. He could have packed up the tent and said, well, I did my job and that's it. But in spite of the adversity, Jeremiah kept with it. I had a funny thing happen to me this week. Uh, Karen and I were going to visit a home and we had not been there before. We didn't know. So you know what? I got out my new smartphone and I put it in the GPS about an hour before we left to get there, Google Maps or whatever. And I put it in my pocket and forgot about it. Before we were heading, driving that way, I decided that I was going to walk across the way and see Jacob and the youth before they had their important meeting on Wednesday. Have my phone in the pocket. I'm walking down the driveway. It says, turn right on Deer Run Road. <laughs> I'm walking. I'm not driving. And it says, go 6.1 miles. And so I had to shut her down. Siri didn't help me on that. I wanted to say, Siri, I'm not ready for you yet, and I'm not going to walk 6.1 miles. I might drive, but I'm not going to walk. Right there in my pocket. Jeremiah would have walked 6.1 miles to carry the word of God. In fact, he tells us here, he says, do with me what you want. That's what he says in verse 15. All of the adversity, he says, all I know is God's called me to do this. I care about God. I care about the people. I'm warning you, adjust your ways. He was in the same spirit as Paul. Remember, Paul had so many people telling him not to go to Jerusalem. Remember a couple of weeks ago? And Paul's attitude is, how can I tell Corinth to give all the way to the very end and place the offering in my hand, and then I turn back because there's a little adversity? Paul said, no, if I tell them to give fully to the offering, I'm going to be sure physically fully that I get there. And Jeremiah is saying here, I am going to carry this word. Now think about this for a moment in regard to us. How important is the word of God that so many people have gone to such a great expense for us to have it? We, we sing that song, Count Your Many Blessings, and, and one of the blessings that we have is the word written before us. There are people who risked their lives to have the word in such a way. There are people who were translators who had given most of their lives in order to translate it into the English language that we might be able to have it, and yet we allow it to collect dust. God's word has come to us with a great expense, with the great commitment of people, and we should never trivialize the word of God. This word reads us. Every other book we read, this book reads us. And it's come to us at a great expense. And it is a sin for God's people to disregard it in our lives. Well, I want you to see the final thing, the compliance of certain leaders. King Jehoiakim, he was an ungodly leader opposed some of the priests were against. But in the midst of all of this, there were cooler and wiser heads that prevailed. It says the officials and the people and the priests and some of the prophets turned around and said, this man doesn't deserve the death sentence for he's spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. There were people who were turning and they were saying, we need to hear this word. They gave the example of Micah, the prophet, who we have his book one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, Micah himself had said years earlier, in the days of King Hezekiah, said to all the people, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become ruins. The temple's mount will be a high thicket. Verse 19, he said to King Hezekiah of Judah and all the people put him to death. No. Hezekiah feared and he pleaded for the Lord's favor. And didn't the Lord relent concerning the disaster? In other words, they're using common sense here. They're using spiritual sense. They said this same message was preached in Hezekiah's day. And Hezekiah, rather than resisting it like Jehoiakim, rather than trying to quell it, rather than trying to oppose it, listened to it and repented. And guess what? Hezekiah did not see the destruction in his day. And then we read of another good prophet. Now, this is not in the same setting as what we just read because 
uh, Hezekiah and Micah were years before Uriah. In fact, it could be argued that Uriah came after um, Jeremiah, and thus this was a written part uh, by the author. But Uriah prophesied, he prophesied, his life was threatened, he fled to Egypt. Then what? Jehoiakim sent people all the way down to Egypt to bring him back, and Jehoiakim had him killed. Two prophets, same message. One was heeded, the other was rejected and killed. What does this tell us? The difference was who was ruling. Hezekiah was a man who feared the Lord, who received the word. Jehoiakim was a man who worked against the word. I didn't know Jehoiakim, you didn't know Jehoiakim, but my idea of Jehoiakim is this. The word came to him and he says, I'm going to do my own thing. First, he, he didn't want to hear the word. He didn't want to hear the word. Now, how can we adjust our lives if we don't hear the word? And so we say, I'm not like Jehoiakim. Are you reading the word of God? Are you trying to figure out um, God's will in your life by reading the written word of God? Are you ignoring it? Are you disregarding it? And so where does all of this lead us today? As we look at back at this prophet who was some 600 years before Jesus, where does it apply to us? Well, the word was given to the people. Jeremiah was faithful, and they heard the word of God. That's what happened then. But the question for us today is, are we making time in our life to hear from God? I'm not talking about some dream that some false prophet gives or looking at some hoodlum on the television that's trying to speak in the name of the Lord that really doesn't know the Lord. I'm talking about personally in your life, are you making time to read the Bible praying that God would speak to you through it? There are no problematic gatekeepers in your life. There's no one standing at the gate of your life and saying, Rick can't hear this. Rick can hear this. No. You have responsibility for your life. Are you more like Hezekiah or Josiah? Josiah heard the word of God and he delighted in it. And he didn't only want to hear it, he wanted to apply it. He wanted everyone to hear it. Are you like a Jehoiakim? By the way, of those three kings, the most infamous one most famous for a downfall was Jehoiakim because he rejected the word of God. I wonder today, would you make the resolution in your life? God, I want to make the word of God a priority. And let me tell you something, just a secret. The devil can steal everything. If you're not in the practice of reading the word of God, don't try to make two hours a day for it because you'll be frustrated. Maybe take five, ten minutes, build up. 15 minutes, build up to 20 minutes, but make it a priority in your life. Let's pray. Father, as we've looked at this example from the Old Testament, Father, we want to stop and give you thanks for the great, great desire that you have, that we have the very word of God before us. We thank you for those who have risked their lives, the prophets, the apostles, the writers of the New Testament, the writers of the Old Testament, those who have, after um, uh, the time that the canon was established, who have worked to translate it into the English language for us, for those who have risked their lives, because, Lord, your word is so important. Father, forgive us when we neglect it. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy that you give us the opportunity even today to resolve anew. Even as in this 11th hour, you gave an opportunity for the people to, to, to hear and to heed and to experience your mercy. And so, Lord, as we go through this week, we pray it. Lord, I pray for the young people this week that the word, when it is preached, would be undistracted, that, Lord, um, the... Uh, students would listen attentively, that there wouldn't be movement, that, Lord, there would be a very sacred time for these young people to hear your word. And, Father, we just lift this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.